do. Then I got a cousin in another state. I won't mention which one. Where we went into their house and lived there. And my mother and my uncle traveled a long way from the district of working and did the stuff I didn't pay in college. And they had always lost his interest in working just with the kids and having a cousin. Not only did they offer them anything to eat and drink, they didn't even offer them a chair. They were hot. Well, that kind of built the relationship. Because in that part of my family, who was never in that? In their part of their family, it was not, it was a no-brainer. What? They didn't even have a dog on the, to offer them a Which I found myself amazing, but it was what it was. And that's another thing. It, um, it is what it is. It is what it is. Sometimes we can't go there and figure out what it is. It just is what it is in your life. I know. I told you this is what I was going to do. Remember, I said, I didn't know. Okay. It is what it is. And it was what it was. It was so good. It was so good. It was so good. This is what I told you to do. Let me have my slides in front of me. Um, so, learn that well. I didn't mind it. We can't learn from it. How many of you are tired of trying to learn from it? You're out of here. You're out of here. The only people on this side of the room raise their hand. So, the rest of you are all good for getting those lessons and opportunities to grow. We had a very, very bad name for growth opportunities. It was called A F G A. Afro. Another very bad growth opportunity. I know that growth opportunities for you, and you would think, oh, okay, here we go. Something else I don't want to do. And that been the song where, well, both of the songs, the first one, Riffs. Take those riffs. Move out into the world. Um, the second song it was being open to growing and learning. The guy that I was listening to this morning on the podcast said, We're here in this world to learn and grow. We're here to find that spirituality within us. Yes, I sound like I'm making fun of them. I hear this all the time. I'm tired of it. Find that deep spiritual self within us and move through the world. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's all really good that I want to have some fun. Yeah, if I got it, I'm going to take the books. I want to have some fun. I don't believe I'm sent in here to evolve. I think evolving is nice. I'm willing to do some evolving. Time. I'm willing to do all the evolving I have to do to come back to homeostasis. No cognitive dissonance. I'm willing to do the work I have to do around that. But in the meantime, I'm not only willing to have fun, I want to have fun, and I get to have fun. So he can learn to grow all he wants. I'm going to learn to grow as much as fun. And you can too. Next slide, please. So, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy, I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. So that's the, the, the being willing to grow and to take risks. How many of you do your risk taker, takers? Oh, that's why I want to know more. So there's a lot of risk takers up here in this room. I always felt that I was not a risk taker. I did the standard stuff, I went to school, and I had a clear intention in going to school. So I could get a job and move out of my mama's house. I was not confused. I didn't care about an education or what I might learn or my experience there. Go to school so you can get a job and move out and stay out of your mama's house. Now, not everybody has that goal that I did. So I didn't take what I considered risk. I hear about people like Mike. was a diver. Uh, the minute the water goes over my head, I'm feeling very uncomfortable. 
extremely uncomfortable. I'm, I'm right back up to get air. So going down to see the fishies has never been on my to-do list. I prefer watching them in an aquarium. So if you're down there with the numbers, the feet, the diving suit, and the snorkel thing, no, the, the whatever it's called. Breathing mask. I'm going to call it a breathing mask, but it's not the purpose. I don't do that. Then there were people that climbed high mountains. I had a cousin who, who was a mountain trekker for ages, so he fell off the stairs and that kind of brought him down to his heels. Nope, we'll do that in here. So I never felt like I was a risk taker. But then when you look at it closely, we're taking risks all the time. It may not be the obvious ones like climbing the highest mountain or diving into the sea, but we're, we're taking risks. You know, being in this spiritual philosophy is a risk. Oh, look at that headshaker there. I was talking to one well-known minister. I won't mention the name because I don't have permission to tell this, so I'll tell this, but not that who she is. But she's very good. I have a large church and interest in her science of mind, and I was taking ministerial classes from her hanging on her every word. And at a break, I asked her, I said, why don't you advertise this church more? And I started with my classes in California. And I said, you, you don't want to put yourself out there until you become a target, huh? She said, yeah. You know, you put yourself out there, people are going to say, what kind of a Religion is bad, it's a cult, and who are you, and what do people believe, and what's the book you use in your services? I always want to know when they say that. Y'all don't use the Bible, do you? <laughs> so taking risks, we take them in different ways. The next slide, please. So getting beyond things that aren't going well. You took that risk, you landed in the middle of it, and you don't like it. How do you get out of unpleasant situations? How do you deal with or adapt to unpleasant situations? A simple one I saw that I thought was so interesting, I was at lunch with my mother and her former boss, whom I also saw as a mentor. He gave me my first job. He had me organize his files. I had never been in an office with files. I don't know if that man ever found a thing again. I did everything in an office, but I don't care what it was. If it started with A, it would be A. And I was the poor dude, and he paid me. <laughs> and he still liked me after I blew in his office. <laughs> so much, much later, many years later, we were out at lunch. I was still living in California when I came up to visit, and we all went out to lunch. And we had a very surly service person. And she came up, and she had a frown on her face. What do you want? We don't have to help. And then she, she said something really obnoxious. And this person that I admired, my mother's former boss, said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Is this how we treat all your customers, or are they not feeling well today? What's going on with you? And he said it in a way that wasn't pugnacious, like trying to start a party or criticize me, but in an empathetic way. So it sounds like you're not having a good day, sweetie. What's, what's going on? And it caught her by surprise. She didn't answer the question, but she did change her attitude. And I said, you got genuine curiosity of what the heck was the matter with you, girlfriend. I mean, it would have come out like that with me, which would not have helped. But he was like, something happened. And you're not too big of to go, what, what is it? And after that, this was years ago, but I never forgot that. So in the midst of 
a bad situation, pure reality. What's going on with this person out there? Even if it's a question you just ask to yourself when somebody cuts you off on the freeway. I wonder what the African American think of that. What are they thinking? Do they not see me? Is this just what they do? I don't know. You know, they come here, they're not going to give you answers. Yeah, they will. But curiosity helps. Next slide, please. Hopefully, they're matching my talk. Because, like I said, the, the slides aren't on my talk. <laughs> so, stepping out of your comfort zone. Remember learning and growing, and we're learning and growing. Well, it can either be fun, stepping out of your comfort zone. And she says, step so far out of your comfort zone, you can get out of your back. My fiance just took me with him on a photographer. He's a photographer. And he took me on a photographer trip to Cuba. I'm not a photographer. Although I'm more of one now since Cuba than I was before I went. And usually, I'm going to confess, everybody, I go to safe places and I stay in nice hotels. And my preference is that somebody around there speaks English. So I've been to countries where they didn't speak English. I was traumatized. So my last few trips by myself, I went, I went to New Zealand, I went to Ireland. But everybody spoke English. So, anyways. But I was simply, again, I told you, not that much risk taken. So Cuba was a different, a different situation. I was in a third world country. I had seen it before, so I was curious. I was curious. I want to know more about it and how these people are. So I stepped out of my comfort zone and went on this wild trip with these photographer people. And I had a marvelous time. And a lot of times when we're thinking that's out of my comfort zone, we have a reaction to that. A negative reaction. I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. It might be comfortable here. You are asking me to do something totally different. Or I'm being called to do something totally different. Ron's not in the room, but I will. But you know, oh, there she is. So far, don't you just love getting up in front of people talking on, on the mic and welcoming everybody and remembering every step of the story? Don't you just love that? <laughs> I, I, no, I love being up front, but forgetting stuff really embarrasses the heck out of me. I, I go on autopilot and then I, oh, I forgot that. <laughs> it's like, okay, but everybody here loves me, so I, I don't really let it get to me that much. Okay, so she, she loves being up here. Yeah. <laughs> but instead of doing it the same thing, you really won't forget stuff. <laughs> oh, I'm so, nervous. I'm nervous. Oh, she's nervous. nervous. So a little out of your comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. A little bit. So a little bit. But you, you know, the statistics say that, I don't know, people just about rather die than get up in front of people and talk. And so that's how scary it is for folks. We just overcome it. I've gotten this over I've been doing this since I'm 12. And I still have a little flutter each time I get up in front of, even when I know you, and my, my sense of back in Seattle. It's a little flutter. Out of our comfort zone. But once we get out of our comfort zone, there's a whole bunch of good that awaits us. You know? Okay. Ah. So, obstacle and challenge in our lives, things that make us uncomfortable or unhappy, are the obstacles we run into, yes? You run into it, you can't get around it, you can't get over it, you can't get through it. Part of it, yeah, is what we're thinking about this obstacle. I can't do it. I'm, it's never going to happen. I'm going to cut part of my talk short to tell you that about the time I get to that place, I leave it to the universe. And say, okay, I've done everything I can do. I'm done with this. You fix it. I'm going to go up about my business. And I do. And ultimately, it's fixed. Sometimes, not in the next two minutes. But ultimately, it's fixed. 
But another way of obstacles was this challenge. I was talking to a friend of mine, and she said, all somebody had to do was tell me, you can't do that. You're not able to do that. You're not smart enough, tall enough, thin enough, wide enough, black enough, whatever that we're not enough of. She said, that's all they needed to say. And then she was off to not only show that she could do it, she could do it like that. She could really do it. And I identified with that. Because all my life I've been told, you can't. You can't do that. I said, I could just list all of the can't do's I'm supposed to not do have been able to do. That I did. And I'm not trying to pat, pat myself on my back. I'm just saying that I was motivated by you can't do it. <laughs> Until I finally shifted around how to motivate myself. But a good place to start is when there's an obstacle, see it as a challenge or an opportunity. And you can get over it or around it or under it or next to it. But not let it stop us. Next slide, Nancy. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. Well, <laughs> we go back to the other one here. Um, it's in there somewhere, but it is sort of like there's a bad situation and you're in the middle of it. Don't build a condo in it and all of and furnish it and invite all your friends. You know, peanut butter kind of a thing. This is bad. Work with it. Move around it. Consider letting it go. Look at this universe. Learn from it. There's been any number of situations where I have said, but what I learned was, in part of my life, I have been a recruiter. I'm coming at past life. I was conceiving in my coming life. But I'm a recruiter, and I would ask folks, you know, what are you good at? And they would say, oh, good at this and this and this. So they were always up to say, you can have a list of what you're good at. And I would say, well, give me some examples. Tell me about a time when it really worked for you. And they would have a time where it really worked for them because they read those books. And then I would say, now give me a time, tell me about a time when something really worked for you. Not in the books. They would struggle and they would find something. Now what I found is that my managers who were hiring these people, I just helped them out. They would say, okay, they say they're blah, 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 blah. They are that familiar. So I added another question. So now she told me that this one from where you put up, where did you learn from it? Never think a while, and most of you would have said you learned something. For those who didn't learn anything or who gave you some superficial answer, they were not the candidate for an hour. But the people are going to make mistakes, right? I mean, who, who goes to work and does everything perfectly? Who goes home and does everything? Who makes this and does everything perfectly? Now, there's one for them. Well, I don't have kids, but I have watched my friends and my relatives and kids. That takes more than a notion. And they really do not have no thought on it. So, what do you mind? So in our own lives, when we're running into these things and it didn't go well, a good shortcut of the learning and mystery of it all, or two good shortcuts. One is say, okay, somewhere along here I have something to do with this. And I may not feel like going there on that. I may not feel like that. How, how did I get this happen to me once I just go over in the backyard? You know, science of mind, we all get to it. Somehow I thought that. I'm like, I don't get how I caused the city to fall down, you know, wind storm in my backyard. But the question is, how do I keep going? And so, how do we handle it? 
And a person you can do that is, what can I learn from this situation? And you're going to go there. Okay, let's see what's next. Oh, okay, there's a one. Resilience. I've read a lot of resilience for a long time. But it very, it was amazing to me. How do you deny that you do now? What you do work? What you get when you do the work? I'm going to say that resilience is the ability to run and stop. You know, you don't get a condominium, friendship, and that all you can get to your back or your feet or your failure. Resilience is saying, okay, that didn't work, but okay, here's where I am. And I hear what they're working with. There's some people in front of mine, and she was very impressed about some stuff going on in her life. And I, I said to her, go into it. Go into the depression. Drop to the bottom of the depression to the world. Because the one way you want to get out of it. Once you get down there, you're going to find a good way to get out because I know you. You've got it. I've known you for years and years. You've got it. This is just a momentary stop. Don't put away. It is not. In the future, you know how the fuck that happened because you can't leave for the rest of your life? I have shoulder surgery. I'm going to go get a stop. I really thought that I would be in the chair with a foreign movie that thought it's a real thing for the rest of my life. This is only a new person. But in the moment, it feels like forever, but it's not. So I don't know if I'm going to say the thing to us. This too shall pass. And I was a teenager, right? So you know I was in the middle of it. You don't have the teenager, you know? The life is over. The bird is never going to love you.
And at one point, the Russians talked about that they want to lower the wall went down, everything broke loose, and the Soviet Union split up. That was it. Oh, and you know, of course, that the United States is, has put an embargo on them. You know that, right? Well, it was only a little note in a history book. I'm still on that for you. And one person said to me, I don't hold you accountable for your government. And I was thinking, and I don't hold you accountable for yours either. You're just people. You, he is not your fault, whoever is running right now. That's not your fault. Who do you listen? And so the resilience of these people, how they make things work, one of the things that we saw often was someone refilling big lighters. I read that you could fill it with insecticide, but there were a number of places where they rebuilt big, big lighters. There were other places where they re sewed the sole of tennis shoes, and on and on. I mean, they just, they just moved through the special area, they call it, where everything went to hell and they no longer had anything coming to the island. They lived through it. They found a way to be through it. And they don't look dismal. Now, granted, they're not going around like Americans, like paint, grinning, happily, everywhere they go. They're not doing that. But they weren't, they did not appear as a people to be depressed and miserable. And as we looked at those darling little 1957 Chevrolets that they have fixed since 1960 themselves, one way or another, again, resilience, they found a way. And so they found a way to make do in a way that we haven't found and don't have to find. That is extreme resilience. So back to us and our first world problems. Here we are. And I refuse to let fear make my decisions for me. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But I know that we've all been in a place where we make decisions out of fear. We're scared to death that this is not going to happen the way we want it to happen. And so we're allowing fear to determine what we do next. And it doesn't work very well, does it? My father got very ill several months ago, August, September, October. And I brought him home way before he should have been brought home, but we, they didn't give me any choice. Right. It's like, well, he can get up out of the bed and walk to the bathroom. You can take him home. Well, now, actually, he couldn't get out of the bed and walk to the bathroom and walk back home. And he wasn't eating. He wasn't drinking. And he wouldn't take his medications. So my fear was my father would die. He was very, very sick. He was very, very weak from a hospital stay because he had two and been there for days. And you know, hostility. That did not fatten him up. Plus, he went in there with a gastro upset that they were trying to figure out what the heck that was, and all that comes with that. So he lost a lot of weight. He needed to eat. He didn't eat. He needed to drink water. So I came at him with fear. My mistake. Dad, you've got to do this. And finally, I said, if you don't do it, Dad, you're going to die. So that pissed him the heck off. And he told my sister what a joke I was that I said he was going to die. But it was because I was coming out of my fear. So I backed off of that, backed way off of it. And what I said to him was, Dad, you know, you actually don't have any deep diseases. You're recovering from an issue, but, but you don't have diabetes or uh, um, heart um, condition or 
something else. I want to know because I will ask them, what keeps you going? What keeps you putting one foot in front of the other this week or this? There's something though that keeps me going. And there's something that can keep us going if we're willing to step up and step in. So this is about we embrace the possibilities. Don't find that this is it, this is all there is. The stepping song talks about that. There's so much more that we get to experience and have in our lives. If we're open to it, we have to be open to it. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We have to be willing to believe that there's more. I'm sure there are things you have done that were never on your to-do list that turned out to be marvelous. Yes. Yeah. I know some of them. And how many of you going to find that if you grow open to being and doing and living into the greatness within? So let's see what the next slide says because it should be my window. Okay, that's good. Interesting in the long run, and you might even have some fun. And so, 